Um, moving on to the items on the agenda, the minutes of our meeting held on the 12th of September 2018 have been on the table for the last 30 minutes. Have I your permission to sign them as a true record? Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Kunwa, have we any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, from Councillors uh, Bolton, Councillor Tim Martin and Councillor Peter, uh, Councillor Holter. That's Tom Martin. Tom, yeah. Tom, yep. Tim, okay. Tom <laughs> um, any declarations of interest? I know there are. So over to you. Um, yes, Chairman. There are a number of uh, declarations of interest in relation to item 84B159 Edison House. The following interests have been declared. <clears throat> Councillor Liz Wheatley, a non-pecuniary interest. A uh, personal friend, she will leave the room, I understand, for the item. Um, Councillor Reynolds, a non-pecuniary interest, as the applicant is known to him. And Councillor Peter Martin, also a non-pecuniary interest, a long-standing personal friend of the applicant, and he will withdraw from the meeting for this item. Also, Chairman, you um, have a pecuniary interest in one of the items, and uh, Councillor uh, Byam will deputy chair will deputise for you. Thank you, Kumar. Uh, members, do any, does anybody else have a pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest to declare? Councillor Williams. Uh, similar one to the Thank you. Right. Kumar, any members? And, oh, and, and Councillor Hunter. Yes, Councillor. I've got a non-pecuniary interest in agenda item one, as some of the applicants are known to me. Thank you. Um, right, any que uh, questions from members of the public or from members, Kumar? None. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Beth, would you like to uh, go through any relevant updates to government guidance and legislation, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the 1st of October, regulations governing the imposition of pre-commencement conditions came into force. From this date, planning permission may not be granted subject to a pre-commencement condition without the written agreement of the applicant to the terms of the condition, except with the exception of specific circumstances. For clarity, a pre-commencement condition for this purpose is one which is imposed on a grant of full planning permission, but not an outline permission, and which must be complied with either before any building or operation comprised in the development is begun, or in the case of a change of use before the material change of use occurs. The rationale behind this, um, the regulations is the hope that local planning authorities will discuss conditions, including any pre-commencement conditions, during the processing of the planning application and before a final decision is made. The local planning authority is expected to share with the applicant any draft pre-commencement conditions at the earliest possible opportunity. If the applicant confirms their agreement to a pre-commencement condition in writing, then the pre-commencement condition can be imposed. Where the local planning authority has not been able to obtain written agreement, it, concerned, it can serve a notice under the regulations, which must state the condition, the full reason, reasons for proposing it, and an instruction that any substantive response must be received within 10 working days from the date the notice is given. If the local planning authority does not receive a substantive response, the condition can be imposed without the written agreement of the applicant. In reality, this means that planning committees can now no longer impose pre-commencement conditions. It will therefore be imperative for officers and members to engage early on in the application process if it is considered that pre-commencement conditions are required. On occasion, there will be times when the committee, upon reflection, would like to see an additional condition imposed, which would ordinarily be a pre-commencement condition. In cases such as these, it may be that the desired outcome could be achieved using alternative wording, such as prior to any above ground works or prior to, commence, uh, prior to um, occupation in order for it not to constitute a pre-commencement condition. The appropriateness of this approach will need to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, which highlights again the need for early officer and member engagement. If it becomes apparent during a committee meeting that a pre-commencement condition is essential, the committee resolution to approve will need to be subject to a time period for agreement from the applicant, and a full reason for refusal will need to be drafted by the committee in the event that the applicant does not agree. The committee would need to be satisfied that, in the absence of this condition, the application would be fundamentally unacceptable, so that a reason on this, a refusal on this basis, could be robustly defended at appeal. And I will be um, uh, 
issuing a briefing note for all members shortly. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Beth. Would you like to run through the uh, performance against government targets as well, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so on your update sheet, you'll see um, at the top box our performance on speed, and you'll see that we are currently um, meeting this target well. And the planning performance on quality, again, we are meeting this target too. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on to the main items of business this evening. And uh, the first application for planning permission under consideration is item A1, reference WA 2018-0692, 23 Bourne Road, Farncombe. And uh, Nicola is going to introduce this item. Nicola. Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks permission for the construction of a new religious meeting house, three dwellings, alterations and extensions to the existing shop, and alterations to access. As members will recall, this application was discussed at last month's committee and deferred so that further discussions could be had with the applicant regarding the proposed Sunday opening hours. The applicant has confirmed they wish to continue with the opening hours as submitted within the application and provided some further justification which is presented within the agenda report. One update to the report has already been circulated. In summary, further clarification has been sought from the Highways Authority, which advises its position remains one of no objection. This is the location plan for the site. Um, it shows... This one? Sorry. Apologies, Chair, <laughs> finding the mouse. It shows the existing site along Bourne Road and Molyneux Road, the location of the White Hart Pub, um, and this is the existing building. This dwelling here, number 21, is outside the application site. This aerial photograph provides a bit more clarity. It clearly shows the site in the context of existing development, the existing shop with flat over, the single-storey industrial buildings, the two-storey industrial building, and again, the neighbouring development, particularly the White Hart Pub, number 21 Bourne Road, the electricity substation with number 25 Bourne Road behind, number 27 Bourne Road, and the detached dwellings along Molyneux Road. This slide shows the existing site layout in more detail with a shop, the flat shown in brown. Proposed site plan. The application proposes the following. Demolition of the existing industrial buildings, retention of the existing shop building, along with the construction of a rear two-storey extension here, the ground floor to be storage and the first floor to be welfare facilities for staff. The first floor of the existing building is proposed for office use. The construction of a religious meeting house, proposed for use by up to 45 people. A total of 10 car parking spaces provided for these uses. Five for the religious meeting house, three for the shop and two for the office space. A disabled parking space would also be provided The spaces would not be allocated to particular uses. The application also includes the construction of three market three-bed houses two semi-detached and one detached. Eight parking spaces would be provided for the residential part of the development, three for the detached dwelling, and one uh, and one of the semi-detached and two spaces for the other semi-detached dwelling. The level of parking provision meets the council's adopted standards and no objection has raised by county, uh, the highways authority. We go through a series of proposed elevations this shows the religious meeting hall proposed. It's a relatively small scale, being 14.5 metres deep, 9.9 .9 metres wide, 3 metres to eaves, 6 metres to the top of the main part of a hip roof, with a dovecot of 1.2 metres and a weather vane additional 0.8 metres. The main entrance of the building is from the front, from Bourne Road, with a secondary, a secondary entrance within the site. The design of the building has been amended in line with Council's Urban Design Officer's comments. Officer dissatisfied the quality of the building is sufficiently high quality for a new community facility 
as required by local plan policy. This slide shows the proposed floor plans for the religious meeting house. It consists of a single meeting room of 64 metres square designed to accommodate 45 people. It also includes a small foyer, cloakroom area, bathroom facilities and a small kitchen. This slide shows the proposed elevations of the existing retail unit with the proposed extension to the rear. Front elevation will be fundamentally unchanged, including the side access to the first floor and existing side window. Extension to the rear will be 7.3 metres long and have a height to ease of 4.5 metres matching the existing building, with a height to ridge of 7.3. It would replace an existing extension to the shop, the two-storey element of which is foot 15 metres length and 6.5 metres height to ridge. The applicant has proposed the hours of use for the shop will be Monday to Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5.00 p.m., Saturday, 8.30 a.m. to 3.00 p.m., and closed on Sundays and bank holidays. This slide shows the proposed floor plans for the extension of the retail unit, with storage on the ground floor and welfare facilities on the first. This slide shows the proposed elevations of the detached dwelling, uh, the garden area to the rear is 80 square metres, which offers considers acceptable and not particularly small given the residential density of the area. The internal space would meet government technical standards. This is a proposed floor plan for the detached dwelling. It has first floor flank windows, but these are to non-habitable rooms. Conditions are proposed that these be obscurely glazed. This slide shows the proposed elevations of the semi-detached dwellings. Uh, the roof line is hipped to reduce the bulk at this level and includes Velux windows to provide light to upstairs bathrooms. With the proposed floor plans for the semi-detached dwellings. Garden areas are somewhat slightly smaller than the detached dwelling at 66 and 70 metres square, 70 square metres, which also officers consider acceptable given the density of the area. This slide shows, this is a block plan to show the current relationship between buildings within and adjacent to the site. This sh slide shows a number of 3D layouts showing the relationship between the existing development and the proposed buildings. The front elevation of the semi-detached buildings will be set back four metres from the side elevation of number 21 when measured from a line taken from the side wall of that house, which runs parallel to the road. The side elevation will be set back four metres from the rear garden fence, eight metres from the rear wall of number 21. The third, plan, third, third elevation plan shows how the proposed dwelling would not cross the 25 degree light line measured from a point one metre from the ground, measured from the potentially affected property, indicating no unacceptable loss of light to neighbouring windows would occur. There's a number of uh, photographs showing the existing site, the access, and the substation with number 25 behind. Uh, this slide shows Molyneux Road looking towards Bourne Road um, with the <coughs> fence line bounding the site and the white property being number 21. This slide shows from the opposite, looking the opposite way to, uh, from with the back towards Bourne Road looking toward, down Molyneux Road. This, again, on Molyneux Road, looking towards the existing two-storey building with the white house behind the tree being number 21. This is the existing retail unit with number 21, Bourne Road adjacent, uh, number 25 inside the site, existing industrial buildings. So the determining issues with regard to this application... Uh, um, matter of principle and technical opinion, the lawful use and loss of employment land. This has been a marketing, <coughs> strategy, marketing report was submitted by the applicant, which was reviewed by the Council of States officers who found the loss of the commercial land to be acceptable, and the other issues are discussed within the officer's report. With regard to the matter of judgment, it's been touched on within this presentation and are discussed in more detail within the officer's report. Therefore, subject to conditions within the report, uh, this application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you, Nicola. This application is subject to public speaking, and I'd firstly uh, invite Sebastian Bone to speak on behalf of the objectors. Good evening, Mr. Bone. I understand the procedure has been explained to you, and you have four minutes from when you start speaking. Thank you. Good evening. When this application was discussed at the previous council planning meeting in September, we, the residents, were grateful the council listened and strongly debated our concerns about the development. Refusal seemed a likely outcome, but it was deferred. We assumed the applicant would act upon these concerns, enter into dialogue with us, and perhaps offer a compromise, especially on the proposed Sunday start time of 6 a.m. Sadly, this has not happened. As the application is essentially exactly the same, all our objections remain. We were led to believe that this would not be brought to committee until November at the earliest, so we have barely been given any time to prepare. The Highways Authority have been contacted to reassess their recommendation on parking and road safety and undertake a site visit. They are unable to visit this week, but have acknowledged that the impact on street parking may have an impact in environmental and amenity terms. In the short time available to us, we have also spoken to as many residents as possible in the immediate vicinity to gauge their thoughts on the 6 a.m. Sunday meeting hall start time and the potential parking problem. Just under 50 people signed our petition objecting on both counts. Every single person we managed to speak to. We note there are no letters of support for the plans. The community hall for worship, as it is described, will only actually benefit a select few. It has been, very main, mean, been made very clear that only the brethren can use it and it will not be available for any other purposes, as a conventional religious building would be. Other such buildings are not in use before 8 a.m. in residential areas, and when occasional services like midnight mass are held, they are just that, occasional. A 6 a.m. start time every Sunday for worship would mean noise and disturbance well beforehand, as people congregate and hunt for parking spaces. Surely this can only be viewed as hugely antisocial in nature, and therefore clearly breaches the policy CF2 of the Local Plan 2002, which states that the provision of new community facilities may be granted providing that the scale of the development is appropriate to the needs of the community and does not introduce a level of activity and disturbance which would detract from the character and amenities of the area. Even if there is only one service on a Sunday, the hall will still be in use for the entire day, as stated in the Brethren's website, because Sunday is the busiest and their most important day. The weekly evening services start at a time when parking is at a premium because of commuters and residents returning from work. This is a very busy time for traffic, especially dangerous in winter and at night. When it comes to parking, the applicants argue that the hall is for the sole use of worship, but when it comes to complying with policies TCS3 and CF2 from the local plan 2002, they promote it as a community facility. The planning report does acknowledge that the location start time of the religious hall in a residential area and close proximity to dwellings could potentially give rise to amenity effects and noise, highlighting this as a concern and attempts to counter this by stating that the above could be managed by the appropriate conditions relating to opening hours and noise levels in nearby existing dwellings and residents of the proposed new dwellings. What on earth does this mean? There are no conditions that address this or that could address it. However, the report does confirm conditions, for example, that the retail unit only opens from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. on a Saturday and not at all on a Sunday, to ensure that no loss of general amenity for proposed and existing neighbouring dwellings would result. So, why is it okay for the religious meeting house to open at 6 a.m. on a Sunday? This is totally contradictory and breaches policy CF2 of the 2002 local plan again. So, in conclusion, if permission is granted, we would have a religious hall which exclusively benefits to close group, yet will have a massive negative effect on residential amenity, giving the community nothing in return. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bone. I now invite Penny Rivers to speak in support of the application. Good evening. Likewise, you have four minutes from when you start speaking. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak to this application tonight. I have watched the video recording of the meeting at which this application was first discussed and when the deferral was made for resolution tonight. At that meeting, I feel that councillors may have been distracted from the key planning concerns by misunderstanding the proposed usage of the buildings planned. So it's my intention to clarify these and speed the approval of this application. The site was indeed a bakery with a shop and a dwelling over and on-site car parking and with no time restrictions at all for deliveries or for early starting. This application is for a shop and an office. The proposed shop is the existing shop and the proposed office is the existing dwelling. Both will be slightly extended and both will offer employment opportunity. The three new and much needed houses on Molyneux Road all have appropriate parking and the houses are in keeping with the building line and with the street scene. And a hall for Christian worship. Indeed, it is a facility for the community of brethren. The hall is for a congregation of just 45 very local worshippers, many of whom will walk to the hall. It will not be used for secular or other activities. All of the churches in Godalming are located on residential roads and all have kitchens. There are no specific parking standards for places of worship. I attend St. John's in Farncombe and there are precisely no parking spaces there. All over the world, brethren start their Sunday worship at 6 a.m. Service times at our other local churches do vary, but at specific times like Easter, services start before dawn at 5.45 a.m. Godalming councillors will know that the brethren worshipped in the hall opposite the fish and chip shop on Lower Manor Road from the 1800s. There was no dedicated parking there, and though so close to houses on both sides, there were never any complaints. And of course, councillors will know that freedom of worship is a basic human right. After the lengthy pre-application process, the brethren are complying with all the criteria set out by your officers, which, for instance, specified the retention of the shop and the provision of three houses. The brethren have also ensured that the hall is designed to fit in sympathetically with the local neighbourhood. The hall is designed with energy efficiency in mind and its acoustic wall treatment minimises the potential for noise disturbance both from inside and from outside. Brethren do not engage in amplified music. Members will remember that they did not raise the 6am worship start time as a reason for objection at the old Bateman site in Cattershall and that the decision of the inspector was to grant permission on that site. If the 6 a.m. start time for worship was not a concern then, how can it be one to councillors now, especially on a site with no time constraints? At the last meeting, one of the speakers said that the brethren make a positive contribution to society, and I echo that and add they make a positive contribution to this community. It was the local brethren who rescued the flood victims of Midro in Christmas 2013. So in summary, I can see no planning grounds for objection and I encourage you to pass this application and not add potentially to the large amount of money already spent by Waverley on failed appeals. Thank you. Thank you. Now invite uh, the ward councillor, uh, councillor Ross Welland, to speak. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a ward councillor, I would just like to make some comments on the proposed development at 23 Bourne Road. Uh, I think it is fair to say that there is much to commend in the designs, the buildings, and the layouts generally. Um, they are overall probably broadly designed terms in keeping the street scene. Certainly three new residential dwellings are very welcome within the area. There is, uh, I think, an interesting um, idea, a place of worship. I think generally I would say that a place of worship and the faith group surrounding it on balance 
where that group so chooses, can enhance and strengthen local community. We see that with the established places of worship, such as St. John's in Farncombe. However, when considering this particular issue and place of worship, we do have to consider it on planning grounds. It was suggested, I believe, when the officer was reading through that, that some justification had been given for a 6 a.m. start. I still struggle to understand, aside from the group wanting a 6 a.m. start, why that has to happen in this particular area. My understanding is the group has another location, not very far from here, where a 6 a.m. start is nowhere, would not inconvenient to residential users at all. Looking, I'm not going to go into great depth and detail on the number of the issues the residents have covered, but I would simply draw councillors attention to the actual plans on the site, particularly if one looks at number 25, Bourne Road, for example, that particular property directly adjoins, um, I think, 10 or 11 of the designated parking spaces there. Taking on a basic use, we have no idea whether or not users of that hall will walk or go to that site by car. With, there's no control as to how they get there, so I think we have to assume it's reasonable that at least a number will choose to attend that site in their vehicles. Those vehicles will be parked directly outside that particular residential property. I would ask how many councillors would fancy being woken up regularly by car engine noise, doors opening and shutting, 5.30, 5.45 on a Sunday morning, just get back to sleep, doors open again, 7.15 when the meeting finishes. Simply because there are 11 designated parking spaces there, more could be accommodated if a group is prepared to double park in that space down there, as quite often happens at any community building. Therefore, I think really in terms of considering the disturbance prompted by a 6M start, to me that doesn't seem to have been addressed in the officer's report. Uh, I also do note one or two factual inaccuracies, not from a planning issue, but I'd simply note it is disappointing to state that the bakery may have shut down in the 1990s. A bit of basic research would have shown that that actually was open until a couple of years ago. And that does not give re residents necessary grounds for confidence to feeling that if those basic factual grounds are not picked up, how can the rest of the report be valid? Um, I think, actually, that probably about covers the points that I will really just sum up and say that I think, from my viewpoint, a um, place of worship in the community can be valuable. I do have major concerns about the 6M start because I think that will cause major disturbance for local residents directly adjoining that property and around that local area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Welland. Members? Councillor Follows. Uh, first, just a couple of technical questions. Could I just ask the officers if um, CF2 was translated from the local plan 2002 into the current version of the local plan and if its wording changed in any way? Um, at some point. Uh, secondly, I just want to thank Councillor Rivers for, for coming along and putting some context to the back of this. One of the main reasons I was in favour of its deferral last time is because I think we were, we were walking ourselves down into a path where the only outcome really uh, was that we would pass something or say something that was outright discriminatory to this particular group. Um, we have found in the course of investigating this that 6am is a requirement of that particular denomination's time for worship. I don't think we have the remit to ask them to change that, and I don't think we have the ability to, to add conditions when no other conditions for any other type of place of worship have, have been suggested or, or enacted at any other point in Godalming. Um, in regards to parking, which I think is the, the other main concern, I think really the, the numbers have met that we've got there meet the local plan requirements. The numbers we've got there, I think, probably will take the number of people that are actually driving it to it. Um, I would also take heart from the fact that as much as we can't have the applicant here in this case, the direct applicant here to explain themselves because of the nature of that group, um, Councillor Rivers is very well connected with that group and is coming from a position of knowledge and understanding. And so I have full 
trust that the combination of the conditions and the assurances of Councillor Rivers that this will be a reasonable and acceptable development. I will also go back to the, the, the actual planning remit of why we're actually here. There is very little here that we can argue against in terms of actual planning and most of what we could argue unfortunately drifts down into that path of discrimination which I'm absolutely not going to go down under any circumstances. Um, so if officers could quickly explain if CF2 has been translated, I would also like if you could indulge me slightly for the benefit of the public, if you could uh, explain to us how conditions are enforced by the planning officers. Um, in my discussions with some of the residents on this matter and with Councillor Rivers prior, one of the main concerns was that if we had conditions in this, would they be enforced if enacted? And so I would just like if you could give myself and residents the assurances of that those conditions will be enforced. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure this uh, committee, Councillor Follows, will, will be dealing with the, the planning matters on this and uh, will not stray into uh, the dark side. Thank you. Officers, would you like to um, address Councillor Follows' concerns, please? Um, <clears throat> just to Point of clarification that CF2 is a, is a retained policy of the 2002 local plan. Um, there, we've, we've, got a, um, we've looked at the weighting in terms of the retained policies and uh, um, whilst there is some conflict with Greenbelt policy for CF2, it's not a, that's, not, um, yeah, that's not, not, you know, not the main point in this, in this case. Thank you, Chairman. Beth. So just taking up a point on um, enforcement of conditions, um, clearly conditions are imposed for a reason, and that is to uh, mitigate any harm that would arise without them. Um, we have an enforcement team. If there are any complaints that are received that, are, that allege a breach of condition, they would be investigated and where harm is identified um, we seek to remedy that harm, and that is either by way of negotiation or formal action. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, could I just ask a question of the officers? The existing use, if um, a bakery were to open, uh, reopen up at this site, um, are there any restrictions uh, which would apply uh, to uh, where with, with existing consents. In other words, uh, could a bakery open at six o'clock or are there any other uh, conditions which would, uh, which would mitigate against a person doing things here? Beth? Thank you, Chairman. Um, if this permission were to, if this application were to be refused and the bakery to reopen, there would be unfettered um, use in terms of hours of operation. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you. Did could you wish I, to come back? Could I just ask, um, what were the typical hours of the bakery uh, that applied when the place was being used as a bakery? We, we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, however, um, typically bakeries do start very early in the morning. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think... Trying to stick to planning matters, you know, if this went to an appeal, uh, that would be a pretty important consideration. Um, we've had that many times when we've looked at uh, planning applications and said, OK, the road usage or parking usage or whatever, what would be applying today under existing um, planning consents um, and what applies in the future with, with these new consents. And I suspect it would be very difficult to, uh, to, to say that what is proposed here um, is unreasonable versus what uh, was, th was there before, or what is there now. Uh, whilst I do understand the, um, if I were living next door to this, I would be very concerned at potential 6 a.m. starts. However, I suspect that this is going to be used by a relatively small number of people. Um, and I suspect those people will be the sort of people who would be very understanding of noise and other considerations. So although I'm not, um, I'm not entirely happy uh, with this as an application, and we debated it long, quite a long time, for quite a long while uh, at the last meeting, um, I think it would be very difficult to defend in 
an, in an appeal if we were to turn this application down. Um, and therefore, despite the fact that I have a lot of concerns, um, I'm pretty sure, unless I hear any good argument to the contrary, that I'll be supporting the officer's uh, recommendation to grant permission. Thank you. Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will also be supporting the officer's recommendation. Um, uh, as Councillor Martin's um, question was answered, that there are no restrictions on the bakery, um, and probably not even one that covered a Sunday morning bakery, and as everybody shops 24 hours a day, one could assume that the actual shop could also be open um, seven days a week by any other um, owner or applicant, um, and it could be an earlier start or even you know, we, uh, late at night because the pub is open late, late at night, um, and I would think that probably has a lot more, um, many more problems than um, uh, the small meeting hall for a specific group of people. And... Um, if it becomes a nuisance, the three three new properties will never sell because they don't. If they don't want to, if they're going to be um, causing problems at the six o'clock start once a week, um, then uh, those houses won't sell. But I, they will do. And a six o'clock start, I think, I would have to say that the applicants, the um, of the new meeting hall, I would think would be take great care of not making a noise with a car door or reversing loudly or making three-point turns and annoying residents. I would think that they, of all people, would actually treat the site with um, great respect for any neighbours. So I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Follows, you wish to come back, yes? Sorry, just one very quick thing I actually missed. Um, when you, you were discussing during your presentation the, off the opening hours of the shop, could you just explain to me if, if, they, if they're agreed, is that's what the applicants have agreed, if the shop is let or sold to somebody else, are they required to maintain those hours under the, under the conditions, or is it basically they can change it at that point? Nicola. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, these, the hours for the shop were as specifically within the application form from the applicant. Um, so if a future lessee or manager of the shop wished to change those hours, they would have to make an application to um, alter that condition that's been uh, proposed. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Mr Chairman. First of all, a question. Um, sorry it comes so late. Um, could I ask what the distance is between what I understand to be a flank wall of unit number one and 24 Molyneux Road? Could I first of all uh, ask that? And then I will just pass on a few observations and comments. It, it looks as if there's a parking space and then a metre-wide well, footpath or something. Is it a garage, is it? My concern is just uh, how wide that is because there's a significant difference between that width and the width uh, between the flank wall of uh, unit number three and the um, uh, back garden fence of 21 Bourne Road. Now, what I'm trying to think about is... Um, there will be a need for maintenance at some time or another um, on that flank wall up to the roof level of unit number one. And if it is too narrow, then there has to be a reliance on good working relationships with the neighbour. Now, to me, that is not good amenity if you have to sort of call upon your neighbour to um, erect uh, scaffolding ladders and, and so on, and you're impinging perhaps on their land as well. This is one of the things that disturbs me about the density of housing these days.
So my preference, sorry, my observation, sorry, is the measurement to hand now? It measures out as half a metre. Half a metre. Now, for me, that's not good design. Not good design at all. So I really do have an objection on that. Whether that in its own right is sufficient to um, go against the officer's report, I don't know. But I do think that that is uh, appalling. And my general sort of thoughts about seeing three houses there, one detached, two semis, um, it is extremely uh, condensed. And I just do not believe that is good for um, harmonious living um, for, the, for the occupants and, uh, and for neighbours. Now, the other thing is that um, there's been a lot of conjecture, anticipation of people's behaviour. And I feel disturbed myself if I'm going to prejudge somebody else's behaviour. I think that in a free society, we have to allow that um, they will behave in a manner that does take account of other people's needs and behaviour. And, and indeed, uh, it did disturb me about this early start. But when we start to think about modern life, shift patterns, the business of opening car doors, starting engines, revving up, that can happen anywhere and um, throughout, you know, during the night. So if, for example, this particular application is approved, then if behavior became, you know, antisocial, then there are mechanisms for um, uh, serving notices on antisocial behavior. So the, these are just my um, observations at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure, officers, that that half a metre figure can't be right. I, I, I don't think you would have um, put through a plan with only a half a metre between a flank wall and a boundary. I've, so you can come back on that. Yes, would any other member like to? Councillor Wheatley. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I think one way or another we're pro we'd probably find it difficult to object on proper planning grounds. But what I wonder, um, when the Guildford School of Acting was actually in residential area rather than with the University of Surrey, they used to have a sign up saying to students and everybody, would they please take care when leaving the premises, bearing in mind you do have residents roundabout kind of thing. And I wonder whether they might even be encouraged, perhaps if necessary, just to remind people so that they don't gather in clusters and discuss anything when they finish the service, uh, um, adding to the disturbance. Thank you. Thank you. Beth, do you wish to respond to the earlier question? Sorry, Chairman, it was actually just to Councillor Wheatley's qu query very quickly. Please go um, ahead. Yes, we would, we would be able to um, impose a condition uh, requiring signage to be displayed um, in particularly sensitive areas, reminding um, uh, the, any users to be considerate of their neighbours. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I will listen very carefully to what has been said. I share the um, residents' concerns in this matter. Anyone who is familiar with the site and the roads know that there is already a traffic and parking problem and inevitably whatever our experts from Surrey have said, inevitably there will be further problems. The matter was deferred to enable our officers to discuss with the applicant or the agent times of Sunday services. Local churches, one in Carlos Street starts at 10 o'clock, St. Peter and Paul started at 8 o'clock. The Baptists in Queen's Road started at 8.45. 8, 
and St. John's Church at eight. All those times are considerably later than six o'clock. And we have got to look at the impact, possible impact, however careful people can be, and no doubt will try to be, there will be noise, there will be disturbance, and I would not appreciate living in a road where every Sunday morning one could be disturbed. So I really do think the impact on the residents and the area should be taken into account. We've heard a good number of people have signed a petition, and it, it does concern me that the applicants, for whatever reason, have not seen or discussed with the residents that could give rise to problems in the future. Everybody wants to have good neighbours, but you should try and start off as good neighbours. So those are my concerns, as I say, the impact on the residents of such an early start. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reynolds. Oh, just very briefly, um, I do share some of the concerns issued tonight um, by or warnings issued by some councillors and, and people in the gallery who live um, around, but like Councillor Peter Martin, I. I don't think there's any sensible planning grounds on which we can object. Um, I do have slight issues on the, the Surrey Highways uh, parking um, comments, um, but the Surrey County Council for the area has spoken in support of this application. I know she will deal with any issues that arise should this application go through, because um, she will be the one responsible to try and mitigate any uh, problems that do arise. So I think on the balance of what we've heard tonight, I can't see any reasons why we should uh, turn down this application, so I'll support the officers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members wish to comment before we move to the recommendation? Councillor Upton. Yes, I'd like, not like to make one general observation. If the dovecot was a bell tower, I would have a concern at six o'clock in the morning, but I have no problem with the, the, the and I would be supporting the application. Doves can be noisy as well. Um, <laughs> Chris, did you, have you come back with a definitive answer? Tell me it's a metre at least. Um, thank you, Chairman. Yes, the, so we're, we're looking at um, the distance between the, um, the boundary of um, plot unit number one and the, the, the site boundary with plot 24. That's approximately a metre is, is the measurement that we've made here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Members, can we move to the recommendation? Sorry. Sorry, Chairman. Approximately, is that under oh, yes. or over? Sorry, Councillor Welland, did, would you wish to come back before we uh, go to the recommendation? No, I think that's fine. Yep. Okay, jolly good. So the recommendation is that uh, permission be granted subjects to con conditions 1 to 30 and the additional condition regarding signage requesting consideration and informatives 1 to 10. All those in favour, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in favour. And those against? Two. Uh, uh, what's the word? Abstention. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Abstention. 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 One. Yes. One. So in that case, permission is granted. Um, I suspect there's a lot of people in the public gallery that would wish to leave now, or are you...? Before we move on to the next item. <clears throat> Pardon? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, he, he left about um, 20 past eight. He cleared off. That's right, because we yeah. missed it. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Apparently it is on the website. It does say it on the website. He, they can't change the agenda because the agenda...
Right, members, we'll move on to item A2, which is application reference WA 2018-0379, the Manor House, Huxley Close, Godalming, GU7, 2AS. The proposal is change of use from non-residential training and hotel use, together with erection of an extension and detached building to provide 23 dwellings, parking, amenity space and associated works following the demolition of, the, of an existing extension. And I would invite Matt to present this. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, before I go into the application, I'd like to draw members' attention to the update sheets. Uh, which includes some addendums for additional conditions and some rewording of conditions and reasonings. Uh, there is also an additional condition uh, which we are proposing to add to the recommendation A, uh, which is to do with water sustainability, uh, which is one of our uh, policies for CC2. Um, so I'm hoping everybody's got that and I will um, continue from there. So the slide on the screen shows the location of the development. Uh, in this area here is the existing hotel with the extension here. Um, the site is within the assessment boundary up to about here in which it goes into the green belt, um, roughly skirting around just before the trees. Um, however, all of the proposed development is within the settled area and not within the green belt. Um, the site itself is located to the north of Huxley Close, which runs along here, and just before the entrance to Macalmont Ridge, which is along here. The site is currently a detached hotel and training facilities, which has a total of 31 bedrooms and has a total capacity of 120 people. The use of the site is controlled by way of planning conditions, which limits the business in terms of what it can and can't do on site. The aerial photo here shows the hotel where the blue ring is, the extension, and there is currently a roof a terrace here with accommodation below. The proposed additional building will approximately be in this area here, and a bit clearer is where the green belt sort of curts around the trees. So turning to the block plan, you can see the hotel is being retained. The new block to the south uh, east here. The garden terrace, which will include a number of units, and the proposed new extension, which would replace that to be demolished. There are also bin stores highlighted in red and parking throughout the site. So the photographs of the sites, we have the front of the hotel uh, in these two with the proposed extension for demolition in this area here. To the rear, we have the hotel, the roof lights, which would serve an internal passageway to the uh, roof terrace properties and the roof terraces themselves. Internally, the, property, uh, or the hotel is vacant. It's been boarded up, um, it, apart from the guard dog. Uh, the property will maintain a number of its heritage features internally. Of particular note is this large communal staircase, which would serve a number of the properties and maintain its vaulted appearance. The property is considered for these features to be a building of local merit. So turning to the proposed elevations, the hotel itself, which runs up to approximately here, would be largely unchanged with a number of small balconies added and some conservatories which would be added to the roof terraces to provide additional space. The other elevations remain largely unchanged with the exception of that being done in the uh, proposed extension which the elevation will follow la later. Block B which is the block to the south east is proposed um, to be detached standing alone and is designed in such a way to reflect the main hotel without causing harm for it. The Council's Heritage Officer has suggested a number of conditions to ensure that the build of this remains of a high quality and doesn't dilute the setting of the listed building. Those are included in condition 20 most notably. Block C, which is the extension to the hotel, which would be on the north, is slightly smaller than the current extension. Um, so there is a red line on this which doesn't quite come up. It increases the height but reduces the spread of the development but again, officers consider, officers consider this to be acceptable in design terms and in heritage terms. So there's some illustrative plans which have been submitted. As you can see, the site to the rear remains largely unchanged with the new extension and block B being added. And from the side, very little has changed. Again, the side elevation is well treed with block B, the new block being here in the existing hotel. And to the front is this space here, is the hotel and the extension. The site slopes down 
and so block B, B, block B would be of less visibility from the street scene. Turning to the elevations, uh, not to the elevations, to the floor plans, on the ground floor of the remaining hotel, there would be three two-bed flats. On the first floor, again, three two-bed flats. And on the second floor, three two-bed flats. On the lower ground floor, there would be six two-bed flats serviced by this communal walkway, which is existing currently, um, which is what the, that blue triangular bit was on the photos which serves this area here. In block B, on block B, we will have four three-bed and one two-bed. And in block C, one two-bed and two three-beds, giving a total of 17 two-beds and six three-beds. All of the units conform to the ministerial space standards and in a number of them far exceed the minimum requirement. Turning to the determining issues, um, most or all of these are covered within the report. So officers have consulted on the loss of the existing use and are believe that the loss of the hotel is acceptable. Um, that's gone out both from a viability report sent in by the applicant and an external commission on that one to receive back. Um, so turning to the matters of judgment, with the impact on the green belt and the AGLV, as mentioned, the developments within the settled area, and there's not any development proposed in that area. The design and visual impact, the impact on residential amenity, the impact on Godalming hillsides, and the provision of amenity space. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Again, this application is subject to public speaking, and I would invite uh, Chris Thompson to speak in support of the application. Good evening, Mr. Thompson. You've probably seen the others, so you know you have four minutes from when you start speaking. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, Members. Uh, I'm Chris Thompson, Managing Director of the applicant company Beechcroft Developments Limited. And obviously, I'm speaking in, on, in support of the application. Uh, the application before you was submitted eight months ago, and it's been the subject of a full consultation as set out in the committee report. There are no objections from the statutory consultees. Unusually for a major planning application, there are 12 letters supporting it and only three letters of outright objection. Almost all of the letters of support are from the near neighbours who share the access road, which is owned by the hotel and maintained by all those who use it. The supporters, I believe, are keen to secure a viable future for the hotel and grounds, as there has for a long time been concern over the intensification of the existing hotel use, as can be seen by the planning history. And members, I'm sure, may remember various applications being brought before this committee uh, to use it as a hotel venue. Uh, and the fact that it was uh, refused is one of the reasons why the hotel is now deemed to be unviable. Now that, ho now that the hotel is vacant, there is concern locally over the number of break-ins and damage being caused to its fabric. The current owners report 10 incidents of vandalism in the last 12 months, uh, which is increasing in frequency. My company, Beechcroft, specialises principally in retirement housing for the elderly. I had the existing building been more straightforward to convert and closer to the shops, this is exactly what the intended use would have been. However, we're fairly confident that the demographic of people that are likely to buy here will be older, uh, probably retired people, um, and uh, having looked at the comments in both the letters of support, um, there are two issues, I think. Um, notwithstanding that there are no comments or objections from Surrey County Council on highway grounds, uh, some of the supporters and the objectors have expressed some concern that there might be too much traffic and not enough car parking. It's a familiar story for planning applications. On traffic, our highway consultants have submitted a report and they estimate the peak hour traffic movements overall in the morning and evening peak hour will be less than the existing hotel use. In fact, there are 85 parking spaces on site currently and 50 proposed in the new planning application. These calculations have been carried out on the basis that there's no age restriction, so therefore, uh, exactly as the application has been presented. Clearly, if an, an older de demographic buys because there, there, there'll be no peak hour movements for work or school runs, then the likelihood is the traffic movements will probably be lower than we're, proposing, than we're uh, suggesting in the traffic report. 
On parking, we're providing one more space than Surrey County Council's requirements, uh, and therefore parking is not a reason for refuse. However, if members are minded to grant approval, um, I can encourage them uh, that there are a possible uh, five or six extra parking spaces that can be found on site. Uh, and if uh, planning permission is granted, we're intending to submit a Section 73 application uh, following approval to add these spaces in by substitution of the floor plans. In short, members, we believe that this is an excellent uh, scheme that has local support, which is unusual for an application of this size, and we commend members to grant approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, Stephen, uh, sorry, Councillor Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, this uh, application lies within my ward, and I have to say I'm broadly in support of it. Um, uh, I went to the exhibition, which was many months ago now, uh, alongside uh, a number of neighbouring um, people who uh, obviously were very interested to see what was going to happen to this building. Um, oddly enough, this building, which is quite a historic building in terms of Charter House, it was built originally for a Charter House master. They also had lots more money in those days, so they didn't have to sell off Greenbelt Fields. Um, um, but uh, it's been a bit of a bane in terms of my email inbox, though, since I became a councillor 11 years ago because of its use. When it was just a training centre, it was okay because the usage was predominantly during the working week, occasionally maybe at weekends, but certainly not into the evenings. And then suddenly when it became a hotel, the evening usage did become a bit of a, a problem for neighbouring properties because obviously when it's used for weddings and things like that, there is an element of music. The music it starts disturbing people, uh, lots of people um, around enjoying themselves at a wedding. It doesn't really sit well to, to houses being around that sort of um, hotel. Um, so that was a problem and there were, I know, certainly two or three applications that Waverley turned down correctly because um, of residential amenity. So um, I think it's right to say that a lot of residents are broadly in support of something being done to this site and I think residential development is probably the right thing for this site. Uh, I actually like the plans that have been submitted. I think the uh, units look good, well designed. The room sizes are are good and big and adequate compared to a lot of new buildings. Um, I think the design is keeping the original house, um, which I, I don't know it's not listed, but you know, it's an interesting, quite an attractive house, and I think the design ethos of it is being maintained. Um, my, my only issue, which I did write about at the um, um, at the presentation was in fact the parking and um, thank you very much for your words on the parking. I do think 50 while within the guidelines is a bit tight. If you could find another five or six I would very much welcome that because that does allow for a bit more space for visitors. Otherwise there's not much space in front of the, um, the building so people might spill over to Huxley Close or something and while there is a bit of room there it'll get the backs up of some of the residents probably. So if you could find an opportunity to do that, I think it would be welcomed by everybody. Um, so, so really, I, I am in support of this application. Um, it's a good building. We mustn't neglect it. And, and I think you're probably right. It that will appeal to a certain demographic where I don't think we'll have the same sort of issues over traffic that perhaps we would if it was somewhere else or of a slightly different nature. So um, I am in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Follows. No, thank you, Chair. Broadly in support of everything Councillor Reynolds has just said on that subject. Uh, just like the officers, if possible, to take us through what a, a vacant building credit is. Um, also, whether £183,819 would buy an affordable house somewhere else, which I assume is what the intent of that is. Um, and also, if it is a commuted sum, do we have some kind of register that can be shown to, to demonstrate that such commuted sums have actually led to the building of an affordable property somewhere down the line for this and other developments? Officers, over to you. So um, we circulated the MPPG guidance on the vacant bill credit. Um, so reading that, probably the second paragraph of that, so paragraph 22, which provides the example is the best way of um, explaining it. Um, that example is that where a building with a gross floor space of 8,000 square metres buildings is demolished as part of a proposed development with a gross floor space of 10,000 square metres, any affordable housing contributions should be on a fifth of what was normally sought. Effectively, it is a policy to bring in brownfield, uh, brownfield sites which are in redundant uh, or vacant uses, as is the case. 
which is contained within both the MPPF and the MPPG. Um, so it is policy compliant along those <coughs> grounds. Can I just go back on that? But actually, my main question really is, is how do we demonstrate that it actually does transfer into an affordable house with that commuted sum in the long run? Because we have had a few of these, and I haven't been certain that we've been able to demonstrate that those things have ever actually happened somewhere in another part of the borough or another part of the town. So to clarify, the one unit would be provided on-site with a smaller off-site contribution. Um, which I believe is in the realms of 23,000. Yes. Uh, housing are happy with the um, contribution and with the process, and it would be collected by way of the 106 and dealt with as all 106s are. Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, my wife was a teacher when I married her, and I'd have been delighted if she'd brought a house of this size and scale into the marriage, but sadly, uh, she didn't. Um, we, uh, many of us know this site and this, uh, this building extremely well, having um, sat on many committees and discussed it many, many times. I was first elected in 1991, and we discussed this hotel, uh, or what it was at that point, at that time. They got rather greedy by selling off the land beyond. Had they perhaps not done that, they would have had a better success possibility for the place as a hotel. It's a tragedy that we lose a building of this sort as a hotel. We need a hotel uh, in Godalming, but sadly it's in the wrong place. Uh, so I think we all probably accept that it's no, now no longer going to be a hotel. Uh, I think the plans that we have before us are, are terrific, um, and I welcome them. Um, and I think we could nitpick around. Uh, it would be good to have additional um, parking. I think that would be very sensible. Uh, the extra unit um, to the left-hand side, as we look at the, uh, the picture at the bottom there, I think is attractive and, and blends well with the rest of the what, is, um, what was the hotel. I think it's a terrific application. It brings us a lot of um, houses, or sorry, a lot of uh, units uh, and dwellings, which I think we need of the size and specification that we have here. Uh, so I will be supporting the recommendation to give permission. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Chairman, I cannot do anything else but uh, support my fellow councillors that have uh, spoken. Um, obviously, I'm absolutely delighted about the national space standards um, having been met and also exceeded in some cases. Um, what a delight it was to hear a developer um, recognising the need for more parking spaces. I shall be um, looking very carefully for a Section 73 application coming forward um, so I can continue to uh, applaud them. And um, that is a very sensible approach, I think, uh, given the tightness of the uh, parking standards which we have uh, encountered before. So I will be supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other? No. Uh, Councillor Byam. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I'm supportive generally of the application that my concern uh, overall, which clearly isn't going to be addressed, is a lack of affordable housing. I think there should have been more affordable housing to this, perhaps in, a separate, in the separate building, um, as happened with Beechcroft in Bramley, where we had a, a separate area where the uh, um, Bramley Grange Hotel uh, was replaced with Beechcroft residences and a parking area to one side was given, uh, put forward for affordable housing, which is run by the Rural Housing Trust. Um, but we are where we are. Um, I just feel the lack of affordable housing as part of quite a major development is uh, lamentable. Thank you, members. Are you happy for me to move to the recommendation? Right, which is, uh, we have two recommendations. Recommendation A, that subject to the completion of an appropriate legal agreement within six months of committee resolution and conditions 1 to 21 with amendments to conditions 1 to 7, 9 to 10, 16 and 21 set out on the update sheet and further condition 22 on the second update sheet plus an additional condition, um, I've forgotten what that was for, uh, something to do with... with, with Sustainable water. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Um, as well as informatives 1 to 13, permission be granted. Can I have all those in favour, please? Unanimous. 
Thank you. So that um, recommendation is granted approval. And uh, follow-up recommendation B, that in the event that the requirements of recommendation A are not met, permission be refused for reasons set out on page 79. All those in favour? It's all three members. Okay. Thank you. That uh, recommendation is also approved. And at this stage, I and some of my colleagues will be leaving you uh, in the capable hands of Councillor Byam. Thank you. Thank you, fellow councillors. Uh, it's my honour to take over the chair from uh, Councillor Else uh, with an esteemed few people, but uh, I'm sure we'll have a very robust debate on this particular application. Uh, I'm uh, actually going to declare a, an interest, a, a non pecuniary interest, in that I've known the applicant for many, many years. Uh, haven't uh, been at social occasions where she'd been present, I've been present, but I don't feel in any way restrained in. in being part of the debate and making a decision. So um, can we uh, move forward to its item B1, WA 2018-1224, 59 Edison House, Flambard Way, Godalming, and proposal for the installation, installation of a window. Uh, Matt Smith, can you give that presentation? Thank you, Chairman. The application site is located across from Waitrose in the, oh, in the new key site development there. Uh, Edison House is that outlined in red. 59 is the top floor flat. Uh, the up-to-date aerial photo shows its location within the site. Um, as you can see, the new development on the corner here, Waitrose car park here, and us about here. Uh, on the top floor, there is a balcony which wraps around the property, and the proposed window is to be inset here, so there would be a balcony between the window and the elevation of the road. So photo A shows the apartment um, from the waitress car park, with this being the balcony in this area here. Um, from the balcony, the window would be proposed in this elevation here. As you can see, the balcony uh, prevents it being as visible from the street scene as it may otherwise be and the potential view from the proposed additional window overlooking Waitrose. Um, the proposed elevations show the window in its location here. As you can see, there is an existing row of windows which progresses up the building, and this window is positioned to reflect that pattern of development. The floor plans again indicate that the window would be set back from the edge of the building with the balcony in between and would service the kitchen. So turning to the determining issues, um, the matters of principle and technical opinion are outlined on the slide, as well as the matters of judgment being the impact on visual amenity and the impact on residential amenity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there anybody who, anybody who wishes to speak? So I'm very quiet. The only thing I would comment, I would presume that the, the company who developed this site either forgot to order the window or it was damaged and it was left away uh, and it's being being put back where it should be. Um, if there's no further debate, um, can I have those who wish to um, approve this application? It's unanimous, Chair, from Thank those who are present. Thank you very much. And there's no other red, rec there's recommendations, um, pages 88, 88 and, and 89, uh, and that's his permission is granted. And there is no reason to exclude press from public, so... I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, Joe. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and, we have, and the chairman and I would wish to apologise for the fact that we had such a late start. We did, but we were thinking of you, unfortunately.